Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome to the Coaches Connection, where we try to educate coaches and discuss specific topic to help enhance our beautiful game. It is a pleasure to bring back Rod Underwood, where we're going to end up discussing the attacking overload principle. Enjoy. All right. It is an absolute pleasure to have Rod Underwood back with us again and more in the Magia mindset, going in a new direction in breaking down and giving coaches a specific topic to dive into. Rod, thank you again so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being back again. So Rod, if you can, um, please get into uh, the topic that we have um, for today and kind of what we want to kind of put out there into our soccer community. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess to take a couple steps back before we even really get started, how did this even evolve, right? The idea of attacking overloads, right? You see it, you see it a lot in, in various games at various leagues, not just at the elite level, but, but at all levels, college level, uh, professional level, you know, division twos, division twos. you see it, right? You see it and you see it because of the influence that the Rondo has had on the game of football really over the years. And, you know, obviously Pep Guardiola bought the Rondos and made them even more noticeable in today's modern game, right? So what I did was, is I said, okay, yeah, I, I love the idea of the attacking overload principle, right? And we won't, we will only touch the tip of the iceberg in the attacking overload principle today because it really is something that ultimately sets up your whole the entire way that you play in terms of how you defend, how you defend in certain areas, how you press, how you draw. It goes on and on and on and on. So my focus will be today is just to hopefully inspire coaches to be more proactive. And I believe that's what the attacking overload principle puts in the mind, minds of players. So, and to the minds of coaches. So let's just jump right into what I found was very important was this next slide, this diagram of how the field was designed, right? And many people will look at this and say, oh, this looks similar to what how UEFA does their coaching licenses. Yes, it does. It looks familiar how Pep breaks up his uh, training field uh, when, he's, when he's training his teams. Yes, it does. Uh, you can go on and on who do different things. But what I did was, as I looked at this and I said, okay, this is what UEFA is doing. This is what Pep's doing. This is what other coaches are doing around the world. But I said, what will it what can I do to make it relevant? And what can I do to put myself in something that I really believe? So I broke the field down, right? And I'm gonna use some terminology that is interchangeable, right? So there's three, there's actually four zones, right? In typical soccer, right? Typical football, there are three zones vertically, right? There's the, the, defensive, the defensive third, the midfield third, and the attacking third, right? What I've done is I've changed thirds to zones. Why do I change zones? thirds to zones, because when I started to think about it, right, the reality is I'm not breaking up the field in thirds. I'm breaking up the field really in fourths when you get into the, when you get into the detail, right? So if you look at the defensive, the defensive, the defensive zone, right? The defensive zone is the width of the field, right? From the end line to about 30 yards away from the goal. Why that, that space? Two reasons, right? Two reasons. First reason is at any level, once you get to the high school age player, from anywhere in that zone, that defensive zone, I believe a player can hit a shot, put your team under pressure by scoring a goal, by the goalkeeper making a save, and creating a rebounding situation that puts your team under pressure. That was that was why I that's why I picked that that distance because I said from 30 yards. You at, at at any level from about high school age on, so about 15 on, I personally believe that a player can hit a shot that could put your team under pressure. Second, I said defensively, if we're under tremendous amount of pressure and our team is really on the ropes, we can get 
comfortably and make the passing lanes and make the gaps between the lines very small from about 30 yards away to the end line in the width of the field, right? I felt that we could do that. I felt that was possible. So then the next zone that you look at is the, the midfield zone. And I've broken that up into two. There's the attacking midfield zone and the defensive midfield zone. And the halfway line, right? The halfway line breaks that up very nicely, right? So the defensive, the defensive midfield zone, so let's ask ourselves who plays in those zones mostly. Mostly the six, the defensive midfield player, right? The eight, the outside backs, and the and if you have a if you have a if you have a system that you play where one of the center backs like to bring the ball into the midfield, those are the players that play in those spaces, right? So when you call it a defensive midfield zone, you're having attacking players trying to take take on attacking roles, but their primary premise, their primary function of a defensive player is to defend. So that's why we call the defensive midfield, the defensive midfield zone. And then the attacking midfield zone is pretty self-explanatory. The 10, the nine who likes to play as a false nine or coming between the lines, the seven and 11, those guys play in those roles, right? They mostly play in those spaces. So you play differently in the defensive midfield zone with a little more safety, right? And the attacking midfield zone, you begin now to look, you're going from the defensive midfield zone, right? And the, you think of it as a buildup. You're building up, you're setting up your team, you're setting up the defense. Now you go to the midfield, the, the attacking midfield zone, and what do you have there? You have, now you're going from buildup phase to the attacking phase of the game. That's why I call that. And simply put, the attacking zone replicates the defensive zone. The difference is now you're going forward, right? And now you're in the you're attacking, you're attacking zone, right? So that's why I call those as such, right? And the attacking zone is self-explanatory. You're, you're attacking, you're going from the build-up phase, you're going from the defensive phase to the attacking phase of the game. And most of your attacking players, and if you play with wing backs, who now, right, and in, in the modern game, the wing back is a has a defensive role, has a midfield role, and has an attacking role, right? And then your eights, right? Your box to box guys, they have the same sort of role. So I find that really important to distinguish that. And then what I've done is, right? I have taken the, the, the field horizontally and created two wide channels on the right side of the field and on the left side of the field. And that space, as you can see it on the diagram, is that from the corner of the box to the sideline, wide zones on each side. Interior channel is the six yard box to the corner of the box. And then the central channel is the width of the six yard box. And then you have another interior channel on the left. So you have, you have all of those channels, right? You have those five channels going horizontally. Wide channel, wide channel self-explanatory. You have more winger type players, more wide players. You're trying to create the width of the field. Interior channel is a very unique channel in my mind. If you look at the statistics, statistics say that most of the time players get the ball, receive a ball, they receive the ball in that interior channel space. If it's in the midfield zone or the attacking or the attacking zone, they receive the ball in that space. Now, here's something very interesting to take into the stats will say as well. The stats will say a assisting action typically takes place in the, in the interior channel. The statistics will also say that finishing actions happen at a high percentage in the interior channel. That's why that channel is really very, very big, really very important. And then you have the central channel, right? The central channel is very unique, right? So if you look at the attack, if you look at the attacking zone and you look at the space from the top of the box to the yellow line that I have there, so that's from the 18 to about 30 yards out. On both sides of the ball, the stats say if you can control that channel in 
the defensive zone and the attacking zone, you increase your chance of winning. It didn't say you win it, but what you do is, right? But what you do is you bring players into the wide channel by playing the ball wide. You, you bring players to the defensive side into the interior channel to open up the central channel because you want to, oh, you, want, you want to dominate that channel. And you can dominate that channel in two ways. You can dominate that channel by overloading that channel, so taking the overload principle, right? Or you can move players to create what I call false overloads, right? In the wide channel and the interior channel. So what you're doing is you're moving the opponent into these areas to look like you want to attack, but your whole focus, can you get the ball and can you get players into the central channel? So that's, that's my thinking behind this, uh, behind this diagram. And really for me, every action, technical action, technical action is built. Every training session is built from this diagram. Rod, before we move on to the next slide, I, I had a little question I wanted um, for myself and I know for audiences that, that work for different levels. And uh, the way it's broken down now, you have a setup for 7v7. Actually, if you want to go grassroot, grassroot, sometimes it's 4v4 to 7v7, then the 9v9, and then the 11v11. In that format, if we can just quickly touch base on the 4v4, 7v7, and 9v9 and 11v11, the format progression, how do we set up this diagram based on those kind of, let's say, age groups, levels, and the numbers you're working and trying to progress with? So if you look at it, right, the best way to look at it is think about what is the size of the 4v4 field, right? What is the size of the 4v4 field? So more than likely, because I'm not exactly sure the numbers of the different sizes of the fields, right? But what I can tell you is, right, in a 4v4 field, you're going to have a wide channel, right? You're going to have all the channels. You're going to have all the zones. But the reality is most of the 4v4 field, right, probably would take place between the interior. The width of the field is probably what? You're thinking, in my mind, if I'm trying to, I'm trying to run through these, these numbers, right, you're going to be a little bit outside the width of the box, and the width of the box is 44 yards wide, right? And you're probably going to be somewhere from – slightly in the attacking zone and slightly to the defensive zone where the goals will be, right? So then what you can do is, right, because you still have a penalty box, right? So you, have a, you still have a spot where you take the goal kicks from, right? So the, so the goal box, right? You still have all those things in place. So now you just do the same thing. The dimensions just slightly, slightly are different, right? And in a 4v4 setting, you get a lot more central play, right? Because there's not much wide area in reality, right? Then if you move on to the 7v7, it's the same, it's the same concept, right? It's the same con now you have a little bit bigger feel, right? So a 7v7 or a 9v9, they're really very close, right? So a 7v7 and a 9v9, let's just work it, look at those almost as, as very similar. And that's probably box to box, right? So the width of, the length of the field is probably box to box, maybe to the from penalty spot to penalty spot, right? And then it's probably if you look at the field and you say from the corner of the box to the sideline, you probably would say halfway between the, the corner of the box and the sideline, that would be the width of the field, right? So if you can picture that, right? If you can picture that, right? So if you, if you picture that, you can say, okay, now we can do the same thing, right? Because again, all the, the field dimensions are the, the field Graphics are the same, the penalty box, the arc, all those things are the same. So you just now take those things and you say, you put it in that context, right? And again, when you get to 9v9, it's gonna be critical that you, that you may use the wide channel a little bit more because you know, in 7v7 and 9v9, right? Typically in these ages, right? You have fewer defenders and then you have fewer mid, you have, Fewer midfielders, you have mostly attacking players. You know, you put three forwards, right? Typically in the 77 and 90, almost all the teams play with three forwards, right? So how do you play those fours? You set your fours up in a, with a three as a wide, you know, a seven, 11, nine playing wide. Are they playing inside? All that dictates, right? 
where your focus of your coaching is in this diagram. No, fantastic, fantastic. So for me, key characteristics of an attacking of the attacking overload principle: technical superiority. What does that mean? That means simply that every single player from your goalkeeper forward must want the ball. Secondly, every single player must be technical enough that they can receive the ball under pressure and not lose their confidence when they lose the ball in those tight spaces. Tactical insight. Now this is this one for me, right? Tactical insight or game understanding or soccer IQ, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to call it, right? But for me, I like the word insight. And then so the tactical insight, the tactical insight is simply that how quickly, how often, how influential a player with the ball or without the ball can impact the game. How does that break down? Example, let's say we're now attacking in the Y channel, right? So if we take this picture right here that you see here, right? If you count the numbers, you've got one, two, three, four, five players, right? Potentially six, it's right on the edge, right? It's right on the edge. And then you, that's the attacking players. And the defenders, you have five. So you got a six V five, right? And so you're creating this overload, right? You're creating this overload principle. So a six against five. But then you got to take your step even a step further. So that's your first line of support, right? So then you have your second line of support, which is those next players, right, that are moving toward the central channel, right? So you have three of those guys. The idea is if you look at the numbers properly on the field, you got 6v5. You want those defensive players to be focused on the ball, focused on the ball, because you're waiting for the one moment to create this action to play the ball to the second line of to the second line of support who then can attack. So you go from that, that overload principle to a possession phase, looking for the one moment to play a line breaking pass, a pair of penetrating pass to the second line. And that second line has to then make the decision to attack. But what we haven't talked about is what we can't see in the picture is on the weak side, right? Hopefully we're creating an opportunity on the weak side that we play the second line. That second line brings in their second line of defense, right? Which creates a one-on-one -on -one moment on the weak side or one-on-none -on moment on the weak side. And that, that takes tactical insight in the sense of players are watching the field. Players are watching their teammates that are near them, their teammates that are far away from them, the spaces that are available, the spaces that are closed. All those things are happening in a split second, all right? That's why it's so important. That's why like the group, that's why like the club that you have on your, on your background, Ajax, that's why they play so many games because they, in training, because they want to create the scenario of tactical, tactical decision, 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 multiple, 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 multiple decisions. Just like in technical superiority, why do they play multiple, lots of games? Because they want their touches to be game-like touches. Do I believe that isolation training is important? Well, I do believe isolation training is important, but in a sense of, in a personal individual development plan for an individual player. We can talk about that another day. No, and, and Rod, you hit some fascinating points and on this visual. It's showing us like we're uh, overloading on the right side. Uh, yeah. And the main thing is creating, especially in today's modern game, when that winger yeah. tucks in the, on the overload, it creates the most space for the outside back to create. Right. My, my thing is there are teams that at times that play the way of overloading and their outside backs are attacking, attacking. But then they change their dynamic by uh, putting a stronger winger and letting that outside back that usually attacks to stay back. Can we discuss why these changes happen? Like, why is it a coach says, usually their team formation, you see them. Outside backs are running down the opposite, the weak side, 
when the overload happened. But then there's some games that you don't see the outside back doing that in their usual routine and the wingers doing that. And it changes the whole dynamic when the overload's happening. Yeah, I mean, it's real important. I mean, you bring up, you bring up a great question because without those wing backs coming forward, because typically an overload principal team, they play somewhat narrow, right? They play somewhat narrow because what you can't have in an overload principal team is these, you need them, but you can't have too many of them where you have this big 60 yards switch because what's going to happen is you, you're always going to find that player to be isolated or that player, players can't get there quick enough, right, to create that overload principle. So there's multiple reasons why they change it. They change it because they feel the other team maybe has an, a, a great attacking team, right? So we can, we can look at what, we can look at what Pep did in, you know, in Man City's, uh, Man City's game against Leon, right? He changed his back line. He changed the way he's playing. His, his outside backs didn't bomb forward like they usually do uh, because he was concerned about their speed. And so that changed his dynamic of how they attacked, right? They were still dangerous, but not this overpowering dangerous, right? And that's what's really important, right? When, when I use the word superiority, right, that goes beyond just the technical side. That goes beyond, right? That goes beyond in the sense of that we need to have superiority in every aspect of the game if you want to be a truly successful, ongoing, proactive team, right? And bravery now. We talk about bravery. Bravery for me is one of the most important things in the game. Are you brave enough? Are you brave enough when you're building the ball, right, in the wide channel, in the defensive zone, three against two, will you, will you build out? Will you build out at risk of losing the ball and countering, and they make no pass or one pass and have a shot and goal? Are you willing to be brave? Are you willing? Are you willing to do that? And that's so important. Are you willing to say, I'm going to set my team up that we can always be in a situation, right, where we have this, this overload principle, right? But something I'll get into later is about how this overload principle really sets you up to be a great defensive overload team. I'm only going to touch on that today, all right? Mobility. Obviously, as you can see, right, ball movement, right, player movement, ball circulation, player speed. You need mobile players, right? You need players that can cover ground. You need players, right, that are mentally mobile. What I mean by that is they – can see situation. They might be the most physically fast or the most physically quick, but their brains are fast, right? That they see the space and they look faster than they are because they can then find the spaces a little bit earlier that creates this overload principle. And you know, sometimes we most of the time we look at mobility as as as, as pure running. I see it, I break it down in mobility as the speed of the brain and then also the speed of the body, how the body moves, quickness, you know, uh, pure speed, all those sorts of things, right? So I think it's real important that we, that we understand that. And then player flexibility. This is something I, I harp on a lot, right? And there's sort of the player flexibility and the positional discipline, right? Player flexibility. Player flexibility means let's create this scenario. Ball goes out for a corner. You send, your, you send your center backs up because obviously the big guys are going to come in and hit the ball, right? The defense clears the ball, but they don't clear it far enough. One of the center backs decides to stay up to become the nine. He needs to have some idea how to play the nine. That would be a great nine, right? He needs to have some idea to play the nine. So my point is, with the attacking principle overload, you also have interchanging of positions where – the two or the right back may become the 10 because they're playing inverted, right, as a right back, right? So the movement brings them to the inside. So they might, not, they might find themselves in a 10 role because the 10 might have saw you coming and floating out to a wider space and you get stuck in the 10 role. So you have to understand some of the principles of that role. Going back to what I said about Ajax, why do you think they play so many games in training? Why do clubs play a lot? Because you need to create these opportunities for players to feel comfortable in training 
before they get in the stadium, before they get into the match at a tournament, before they get into a regular league youth game, that they've, they've experienced that feeling of being in those roles. And that leads into te- to positional discipline. Every player, because in this situation, right? In this situation and the, and the attacking overload principle, you're saying, okay, the ball is on the right. And let's say the seven has come out wide. It's coming to the wide channel. Let's say the tens come to support. One of the, the eights come in support. The twos come in support, right? We must know that when, when they send three players to make it 4v3, we might be getting a little bit, okay, maybe the numbers aren't right for us. Then they send that fourth player, though so this is not. So we need, to be able to, we need to be able to say, okay, our six is angled in the interior of the central channel that I don't even have to look, that I can say, I know it's going to be there, and I can connect that pass. He helps me get out. We change the field, get to the weak side. That's why it's so important for, for positional discipline. Because without the positional discipline, it's very difficult to be an attacking overload team because players need to be in spots to create the opportunity that you can play out of that, out of that, that, that overload principle in a wide area or a central area, right, central channel. You need to know that the seven's going to be, you need to know that seven, you need to know your seven likes to be in the interior channel in the attacking zone. So when you look to play out, we know it's going to be coming into that space, right? No, we're going to be coming in that space. We're going to be coming in between the lines. So we understand that. And so that's why positional discipline is really important. And I never once said this was easy. I never once said that this was something that's going to happen overnight. But the thing is, the, the coach has to believe it. And the coach has to, has to have a vision. And the coach must lead the players to this understanding. So the effects of the overload, attacking overload principle on the opponent, right? I've sort of started that, right? Unbalance the opponent, right? So if we're in the central channel, right? And the defensive midfield zone, right? And we have, they have their eight and their nine in that space their defensive eight and their defensive nine in that space, right? And we've got our four and our five, right? Helping in the buildup inside the defensive zone, right? So we got our four and our five, right? So that gives us those two players, right? And then our six is there, right? And then our 10 comes down. So now we've created what? Two center backs. We've created our 10 coming down and our six. We've got a four V two in that area, right? So now, They've sent players. So we've got to be able to say, where is that space, right? So now they're coming high. So now we say, okay, we brought them forward. Now there is space in between the lines, in between the lines. And something that a lot of, I like to work with is that I just simply work, I play by the numbers, right? If we've got four and they've got two, that means we've got six, we've got seven other players that are available somewhere on the field, including the goalkeeper, right? Now, they've only got two in that immediate ball space. So they've got nine players somewhere on the field, right? So our focus is to find out where they are the least prepared with numbers. And then also, if you think of it in another way, where we have the ball in the wide channel and we create a 3v2, right? And then one one more player comes, so we create a 4v2. But the other team doesn't feel comfortable in that situation. And especially if we're in the if we're in the attacking midfield zone in a wide channel. They send another player, right? And now it's 4v3. They have opened up a space, right? So they've tilted, I use this phrase, I, I got this from a coach before, he says, they're going to tilt their defense toward the ball, right? So eyes, body shape, everything is focused there toward the ball. So the unbalancing area is going to be slightly away from the ball. So we have to move the ball to certain unbalanced opponent to find the ultimate space that we want to attack. But what I said earlier, right, most of the scoring actions and assisting actions come from the interior channel. So we're always trying to attack that interior channel, either ball side or away from the ball. So ultimately, we can have a finishing action in the central channel, which puts us in front of the goal, right? So... Again, we mentioned this earlier. The unbalancing situation causes 1v1s on the weak side. It's pretty self-explanatory. Opens the space between the lines. I tried to create that picture a little bit, right? 
by saying we, we create a 4v2 in the central channel and the midfield zone. So they're starting to, so I like to, I mean, I like to use this phrase, right? They keep inching forward, inching forward, right? And sooner or later, someone's going to misstep, right? And when they misstep, there's a space between the line, the gap or the half space, whatever you want to call it, right? I like to say space between the line. You can call it gap. You can call it half space. Whatever football language you can create your team that your team understands, that's on you. But that's what you have to try to create. The mental aspect of it. The mental aspect of the, of the uh, attacking principle overload is unbelievable. Why? Because players are always chasing the ball. Players are always, and it go, players are always, the defense is always chasing the ball. You have it, you're resting, you're moving, you're looking, you're trying to, you're trying to exploit spaces, right? The physical effect, the physical effect, you're chasing the ball, man. We all played the game. At some point, I'm not chasing that ball anymore, right? You say, I had enough, so you're going to leave it off to the next guy. And again, it, it goes back up to the, the previous point, the mental effects. Someone switches off, the space opens up. We can recognize that space. That goes back to what I said earlier, the tactical insight. Players got to see that and they can see, well, they switched off, they opened the space, we got to go. It's just, it's, just the, it's just the opposite principle. It's pretty simple. It's like, if they don't come, we don't go. If they come, we go, but we don't lose the ball. What also this does is this allows us, this allows the attacking team, right? to be able to press immediately in the immediate space. There's a, lot of, there's a lot that goes on in that press situation, right? So in that immediate space, let's say we got a 4v2 in the wide channel. Johnny loses the ball. We got 4v2. Are we going to drop? We're going to press. We're going to press, right? Because we're a numbers up situation, right? We created this little space, lack of a better phrase. We created this rondo on the field. We lose it. We're 4v2. We can press now, right? We can press, we can, we can press now, right? But if they're good, right, their first pass or their first move is going to be trying to break our press. And then when they break our press, right, we become now a team, right, that we start to trap and press, right? What does that mean? That means they've broken our press. They've done a great job, right? They're good. They're quick. They're very technical. They're very similar to our team. They have a lot of good players. So they, they play out. They press. They they, they play out, now they have the superior situation. So we just get in, right, behind the ball. Or we start to shape and tilt the field, as I said earlier, toward the ball. So if they made it all the way, let's say the Ronda was on the right in the wide channel, and they've been able to play to the six who in the central channel, who then the six has been able to play to an eight in the interior channel and the attacking zone or the midfield zone, where are we going to try to win the ball? So we start tilting our team, right? Because what have I said earlier? The danger spaces is, is that in the defensive zone between the, the yellow line there you see in the top of the box and, and the two interior channels. We don't want them to get in those spaces, right? So we want to say, let's, we're going to set the trap wide. So now we shape, we overload, we defensively overload the interior channel, the central channel, right, near the ball, making sure we have at least a number or two numbers or two players in the interior channel on the weak side. So the trap is in the wide channel. So we're setting them up so we can press them in the wide channel. So again, I didn't say it was easy, but you see how I'm using the terminology? This is how, this is how I'm using the terminology because I can say to my team, hey, we're gonna trap them in the wide channel. The other team doesn't know this, we're gonna trap them in the wide channel in the, in the midfield zone. We're going to attack them. Like we're going to trap them in the wide channel in the defensive zone. So they know what to do, right? They understand that. They understand that by just using not football language, they understand that, right? And then it opens shooting opportunities, right? It opens shooting opportunities because it opens spaces, open gaps, opens lanes, all these open passing, all these different things. Because when a guy drops off into the, into the gap, especially into the midfield, into the attacking zone he's almost always unmarked they can almost always turn the ball and face the goal or they can almost always play quick combination spin off and look for a ball played behind but it always happens so it's really really important right it's really important that we understand that all right next slide 
Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to go right into it with this, but I think you hit some key points, Rod, with the overloading and the rondos. It's such a simple diagram. It's such a simple explanation. But soccer is a simple game, you know, but it's hard to play a simple game. It's, right. it's difficult. And that rondos you talk about, that overloading you talk about, no one did it better than the 2008 to 2012 Barcelona team. And, and I mean, it came down from the La Masia school where those kids, and then they selected Guardiola that was basically crafted by Joan Cruyff. And then he was in that academy system and they all, all the ingredients was in place. And then they came in and you're talking about open shooting opportunity. They made sure it was open. That's how they created overloads everywhere on the field. And they created that. But I think it's a balance of having the right players. It takes years to play that way too, because you got to be on the same page. I mean, playing rondos, everybody's like, oh, let's play rondos, let's play rondos. You see a lot of sessions that are rondos, but coaches can't implement that because maybe the player's technical ability is not there. The mental uh, uh, abilities are not there. And then you touched on it. Mental effect, physical effect, sets up the opponent to press, and then it creates the shooting opportunity. So I, 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 that is so vital for our listeners to know in those moments and where that schooling kind of came from, but it's hard to implement it and it takes a lot of repetition. So fantastic. Yeah, well, on here's, that. Here's, yeah here's the thing, right? Coach, you have to show up every day, right? Every day and train the same principles. I didn't say the same exercise. I said the same principles. The same principles every day over and over and over again. Let the kids fail in training. Or even at the pro level, let the players fail in training. So that when they get to the game on Saturday night and the stadium's packed, they know how to respond to the mistake. I didn't say they knew how to, I didn't say they understood the rondo and how to move the rondo all over the field, right? Because you mentioned something about rondos. Most play, most coaches play rondos as a rondo. But how do you take it and put it in a training exercise that it leads to a real game? That's a whole different scenario. But what I said is, I said, we're training the players that how to react to the mistake and they understand the mistake and they're not afraid of the mistake. They are more concerned. They're less concerned about the mistake and they're more concerned about attempting things. And that is so different. That is a minimal mindset change, but that's a maximum mindset effect. And it's just so different. It is. It is. Thank you for touching on that too, Rod. And then we go into our next slide. It shows the scenario in a clip. Yeah. So what we'll do is, right, um, in this clip, this is, this is Napoli, right? This is Napoli's buildup. And I would highly, highly, highly recommend it, right? Because what you see is you've got one guy coming and you can see where the players are. You can't really see them in the frame, right? But out here on the goalkeeper's right, there's a player there. So you you got an easy build-up phase. So our recommendation, if you want to see the video, ask for the PowerPoint. You should be able to click on the PowerPoint. Best that you go and look at it yourself. So to finish, I want to ask the question, why the attacking overload principle? And, and some people might say, you know, this is a build off of what Barcelona did with all those great, wonderful players. But what I will say is this, the attacking overload, if you look at Leipzig, you look at Bayern, you can, you can go, you can look at Man City, you can look at Liverpool, you can look at Atalanta, because Atalanta, they are do a little bit more in the wide areas and they do in the central areas. They overload the wide areas for more of a, a longer ball into the box, right? I can go down the list, I can go down the list of, of teams that still use attacking overload principle. Do they use it just like Barcelona did in the narrow area and with, with the narrowly and bringing players in? No. What they do is, right, they play a longer ball, right? Which they play a longer ball, right? Let's say the the six plays a ball diagonally to the seven who's in the attacking and the attacking zone, right? 
But the nine understands, right? The nine understands he's to join in. The eight understands he's needs to join in, right? And if that's happened, the two knows that it needs to have been coming forward. So this is how they create the attacking overload principle, right, around the ball. So why the attacking overload principle? Let's take it from a youth perspective. It's demanding. It works in the technical ability, tactical understanding, physical ability, mental ability, leadership ability, communication ability. It works on all the, every component of the game it works on. Number two, it's fun to watch, right? I like to see it. I think a lot of players, teams like to see moving the ball, short passes, long passes, players getting involved. You know, at the professional level, why at the professional level? You, you, know, you look at the Champions League final, there were world-class players all over the pitch, right? Look who scored the goal. He wouldn't be considered, right? Koeman would be considered to be one of the top five players on the, on the pitch on that night. He would not be, he just, he wouldn't be, right? But what it does is it allows players like him to make a difference. It allows players like him to make a difference. So the attacking overload principle is fun, it's exciting. It trains players at a young age, but at the, at the, at the professional level, it provides opportunity for what I would call the next level player. Not the player, those elite guys, but those players that are, you know, not in the top 11 or in and out of the top 11, not in the top five in the team. But because of the way you play, it puts you in spots to be dangerous. And then it allows you freedom to express the ability that you have. It doesn't, it doesn't say you have the express ability that, player X has, but it says you have to, and when you get in that situation, because we know at that level, professional, you put any player in a 1v1 situation. The defender's going to be a little bit nervous, and the attacking player's going to be a little bit happy, right? So this is why the attacking overload principle from the youth all the way up to the professional level. And it doesn't have to be narrow like Barca played it. It doesn't have to be like Bayern played it. It doesn't have, it has to be how you are how your team is, and you might have to make some serious tweaks, and you might only be able to do 50% of it. But again, at the youth level, all the players are involved. It's training all the aspects of the game. At the pro level, it's different because you can go and pick and choose your players that you want. When you're scouting players, you pick players that think can help you if you work on the overload principle, or you want to be a counterattacking team, or you want to be a more cross and finishing team, whatever. But for me, I don't, believe, I don't believe the attacking overload principle will ever die because it demands the physical side of the game and the ball side of the game. That's why I don't think it will ever die. John, thank you for having me, man. No, absolute pleasure, man. I, I really loved it. And like I said, I think it's a very vital aspect of especially the modern game we're in today to dive into – the attacking principle and overloading and creating overloads uh, on our pitch. I think it's an element that is, when you talk about it, it's easier when you talk about it to actually go out there and implement it and design the sessions to day to day, working with your players, you getting them all on the same page, having the right players too. I mean, there are players that, I mean, how frustrating is it as, as coaches when you're like, this is clear. You talk about it with your staff and you're like this player or maybe a couple players, they don't get it. And at times those are tough decisions as a coaching staff that they got to decide that from the neck up, they're not at the level, maybe they're professionals, but they're not at the level to be a part of this team because they cannot play this style of play that we require them to understand the attacking principle and overloading and understanding where you overlay on this side for, finding and exposing the weak side and um, finding those open spaces to create those shooting chances. And, and like I said, everybody can't play like Barcelona and everybody can't play like the English Premier League and like Liverpool, Man Cities. Uh, in America, when you watch the game, it's different than uh, China. It's different than Italy. It's different than Spain. So 
there's levels to levels of how the diaphragm starts and it starts from the youth you, you, you just discussed the youth level but it starts from what's the education they've got and the mental mindset i think you hit a lot of key points but we keep going back to the mindset if you don't have the players that don't understand the game and can't adapt to styles of play because maybe they're athletic maybe they're technical but when you're explaining them a tactical style that you want them to implement and they just have not watched the game as a youth they don't know it they don't get it they don't see what your mind is as coaches you're like you know this is the stuff that we got to move on so rod Thank you so much. This was uh, brilliant. Thank you, man. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Of course, our pleasure.